Yeah, um, so uh, our report was really generated based on everybody talking about how antibody tests were a key factor in opening the economy. So we dug into that, and we, we really had three takeaways. Number one, antibody tests are really limited in what they can do based on the incidence of the virus in the population. So even a perfect test is only as good as the incidence itself. And at this point, most people seem to think that it's relatively small in terms of percentage. We've heard most commonly something between... 5% and 15%. So even a perfect test, that would be the best case that uh, you would be looking to clear back into the, uh, into the workforce. Secondly, uh, we found that the rapid tests that we've seen generally have much lower specificity, which is concerning. That means that there's a high false positive rate. That's dangerous because it tells more people that they have antibodies uh, who actually don't. If people think they're immune, they may engage in riskier activity and then catch the virus potentially and unknowingly spread it uh, around. The FDA is digging in a lot more here and needs to continue to do so. Uh, more EUAs are being granted for these antibody tests. I think there were three in total now and two yesterday. Um, and that's a higher bar than merely needing to notify FDA, which is really what's been going on. And the third thing is the instrumented tests, like from Abbott that were announced yesterday, they do have much better accuracy, sensitivity, and specificity than a rapid test, but they require more intense logistics and, of course, are not rapid. So Abbott has talked about volume getting to 20 million tests by June, and that's great. And there will be other high-volume instrumented companies that will follow. But the question that we have here is, how do you get the samples to the lab with capacity? It requires a venous blood draw, and then you send that off to the lab. So we have logistical issues that we've seen with the PCR test, for example, on a smaller subset of the population, just on symptomatic people. So how can we imagine the logistics around an antibody test where everybody's going to want to be tested? We're talking about hundreds of millions of potential tests. How do you actually get those samples and send those to the lab? Those logistics are really important, and they've been a key right. issue, not just with these antibodies, but everything else. Absolutely. Those are huge questions to ask. And, you know, people are thinking about using these tests. Everybody wants to know, have I been exposed? And I just didn't know. I just got an email today from somebody saying they got an email from a lab saying you can get an antibody test. As people themselves and as businesses are considering whether to use these, do you have tips for how people can determine what's a better test than another one? Or are you just saying the incidence is so low, they're not useful at all right now? Well, certainly they can be useful if the specificity is high enough. We really want to minimize the false positives. So something with the specificity that is in the high 90s would be ideal. That means that you would only have a false positive rate of, let's say, 1%, maybe 2%. Uh, that would be ideal. Uh, anything close to 100% is where you want to be. I think we just also have to be realistic on what they can actually do. Again, whatever that incidence rate is, that's what a perfect test would be able to clear. If 15% have this, that means 85% uh, of people will be negative on these tests and will not be able to return to work. So I think we just have to be realistic about what these tests can and cannot do as people are evaluating options. So, so Brian, what's the conclusion uh, of all of this? Is it that uh, the hope for herd immunity being a bit of a game changer in, in the coming months uh, is a false hope and that uh, aside from very selective uh, opening up of the economy and going back to work, that we have to wait for a vaccine? Well, that's going to depend on the incidence rate, and certainly I, you know, I'm not an epidemiologist, I'm not in public health, so I, I don't have a, a particular opinion on where that incidence rate is. We're looking at the data just like everybody else is, um, and from what we can tell, that is somewhere between maybe 5 and 15 percent based off of the data that's out there, which would take you far away from having that herd immunity. I think these antibody tests do have a role to play, but we have to be realistic just on how valuable that they can be. They're not a silver bullet. They're not going to clear the majority of the people to go back to work. And I think that's just what people have to kind of recognize at this point. Well, Brian, looking at the research pipeline and what is coming from dependable companies that have done this before, how far away are we from reliable at-home antibody tests? Yeah, so um, one of the issues around those um, uh, at-home types of tests, and, and I'm just going to call these rapid tests in general, they're not cleared for at-home use per se, but uh, rapid tests in general, um, they do have generally a lower accuracy rate or lower sensitivity and specificity than an instrumented lab, uh, product would, and you can kind of understand why, right? So these are little strips that look like pregnancy tests um, as opposed to um, uh, something that's run on a large piece of equipment on a much bigger sample. So. 
I, I'm not sure that it's even about kind of getting um, uh, bigger companies involved here. I think there's somewhat of a limitation on the technology that's going to limit the, uh, the, the usefulness of these rapid tests. Um, we would love to see them get up into the high 90s, but I, I think that more realistically something in the low to mid 90s is the best that we can hope for. That's the best that we've seen to date. That would still result in a false positive rate of somewhere of you know 5% plus, which I think could be uh, potentially dangerous.